I think we will get started. Um, thank you, everybody, for tuning into this webinar for Busy Lawyers. I'm Susan Letterman White. I'm a practice advisor here at Mass Lomat. These are monthly webinars that we have pretty much on every Wednesday of the month around noon, um, if not exactly at noon. And we like to bring you um, information that you can take back home and implement immediately in your practice. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Brett Burney. Brett helps legal professionals better understand what apps, tips, and workflows they can use to effectively work on the go. Brett also runs the award-winning Apps in Law blog at www.appsinlaw.com, where he provides short video reviews of apps and interviews lawyers about the apps they use in a popular podcast. Brett is a frequent contributor to Legal Tech News and speaks around the country on litigation support, e-discovery, Mac, and iOS related topics. You can email Brett at any time at Bernie at, and that's B-U-R-N-E-Y, just like on the first slide there, at BernieConsultants.com. And, um, if you have any trouble getting in touch with them, let me know, and I'll fix that. Make sure you do. So before I turn it over to Brett, I want to let you know that we're going to have plenty of time at the end of Brett's presentation for questions, but don't hold on to your questions. Put them right into the chat box as soon as they occur to you, and at the end, I'm going to relay them to Brett, and he will answer them all. I promise. No rush. Okay. Thank you, um, and Brett, take it away. Wow, thank you, Susan. I appreciate it. It's great to be here with everyone today. Thanks for taking a little bit of the time of your day, your busy day. I know hopefully you're enjoying a sandwich or something here just for a few minutes that we can talk a little bit about some uh, mobile apps. Uh, as Susan mentioned, I have a lot of fun on a little side gig that I have with a little blog called Apps in Law where I started, I just really wanted to do some short video reviews of different apps that I knew lawyers were using since I do a lot of training around this area and a lot of questions that come up. Uh, but you can see I had the pleasure of interviewing Heidi Alexander there from Lomap, uh, Lawyers Concerned About Lawyers. Uh, let's see, it was a few months ago. I've known Heidi for a long time and it was great to have her on. I've been doing a podcast along here as well, where if you go to the site, you can see there's different folks that I talk with, just trying to be get a better understanding even from different attorneys that I talk to about how they are integrating and using some of these apps in their everyday practice. Because it really has been a dream of ours for so long, right? That we have always wanted to work, do our work, accomplish things from wherever we are. At any time, out in the great wide world, we don't necessarily want to be chained to our desk. And this has been a dream for a long time. We've tried all different ways to make ourselves mobile with our computers. Now, the majority of the apps I'm gonna be talking about today are going to be focused on iOS, which is iPhone and iPad. And the main reason you can see from a little graphic here from my good friend, Jeff Richardson, who runs another excellent blog called iPhone JD. He is an attorney at a large law firm down in New Orleans, and he's been writing this blog for many, many years. But every year he goes through the ABA Legal Technology Survey, where the ABA goes out and interviews many of their members on different questions on technology. And of course, Jeff looked at the part of the survey where they were asking attorneys what devices do you use on the go? And you can see a vast majority of attorneys are still tethered and using the iPhone, which is great. Although this was the first year that the Android operating system came up to 25%. Um, so I just want to let you know, even if you are an Android phone user, don't worry. We are, I'm going to make sure that anytime that there is an app that I'm discussing here that is available for Android, I've got a little green Android robot that will indicate to you that this app is also available for the Android side. And then on the tablet side, in a similar fashion, you can see since we've had the current day iPad in 2010 is when it was released, that the number of attorneys that are not using tablets have significantly decreased over the last seven years here to about 
but when attorneys have stated in this technology report that they are using a tablet device, it is by far the iPad is their chosen device. Now, a lot of people ask me today about the Windows Surface, which I'm a fan of the Windows Surface, but I will say, even though Microsoft initially talked about it as a tablet device, it really is a fully functional Windows laptop, first and foremost. And then, by the way, you can rip off the screen if you want to use it like a tablet, but um, I don't really consider it a tablet in the sense that you can run full Windows software on a surface, which is actually really great. Uh, so I think that's probably what the Windows aspect is there. Now, when we come to mobile devices or what we typically think of mobile phones today, we primarily think of them as phones, right? A phone that can maybe do a few other functions. However, I would like for you to think about one thing as we do a takeaway here before we right before we jump in the apps is the number of things that your mobile phones have replaced today here's here's my short list <laughs> my mobile phone takes care of email on the calendar it's my task list it is the way that i listen to radio today or the news get the news on newspapers it's the way that i actually watch television today whether I'm streaming something or I just jump on YouTube on my mobile device, for example. It's the way I read books. I like paper books the same as anyone else, but I can carry so many on a phone, on my mobile phone, so that when I jump on an airplane, for example, I have access to a ton of different books. The magazines is how I check the weather. Now, that list alone would be great, but I've got a whole other column here <laughs> of things that this device has replaced for me. It's my travel itinerary. It's how I track my flights. It's the way that I take my boarding passes. It's the way that I surf the web, the primary way that I surf the web today. It's my alarm clock whenever I go, even when I travel or when I'm not traveling. It's my GPS. I don't even have GPS in my car because I have my phone, which has a built-in map capability. Oh, and by the way, by the way, this also can make phone calls. The main takeaway I want you to get from this slide is don't think of this first as a phone that can do other things. This today is becoming your primary computer. That's the way it is for me and I suspect many for you. And what's great about that from a capability standpoint is the things that we can do in just a moment as we run through these apps. But also the fact that if this is your primary computer, you need to start treating it like a computer that carries the most confidential and sensitive information that you have been entrusted with. Making sure you have a passcode on there, for example. Making sure you have your backups enabled. Extremely important today, this is a computer now that, oh, by the way, can also make some phone calls. I'm not the first one that came up with this idea. Walt Mossberg, the former technology editor for the Wall Street Journal, talked about the fact that 10 years ago, 2007, the iPhone was launched and it's continuing to get better. In fact, today it has become the new personal computer. So I hope that that just is a good takeaway to help you understand better about the capabilities that this can do, these things can do, even on your iPad as well, but the fact that treat it as a computer that can also make some phone calls. So let's jump in, number one here, with the apps that attorneys should be using, cloud-based file management. Now, this is a little bit broader than just really a mobile device because it is managing files or using a cloud-based file management system, but it's probably the best way that you can get access to your files when you are out of the office. Now, I've mentioned four of them here. I find today most people that I talk with when I give CLEs have a little bit of experience with Dropbox, whether you use it for work or probably most of the time people use it on their personal side, so they have a familiarity with it. And similarly on Box. Some people have Microsoft OneDrive. In fact, if you have a subscription to Office 365, you already have a terabyte's worth of storage space in Microsoft OneDrive, which is very similar to Dropbox. And then Google Drive is sort of the main competitor, I guess, to Microsoft in the sense that it gives you access to word processing apps in your browser as well as the Drive functionality there. I find this is the best way for most practitioners to access their files when they're out of the office. The idea being that you're not gonna print everything out before you leave the office, although that's the way we used to do it, right? I'm gonna go to a meeting, so what do I need to take with me? I'm gonna print all these documents out, stuff them in a file folder and put them in my briefcase, 
so that I can make sure that I have access to them all when I get to the meeting or the hearing or whatever I'm going to. But today you don't necessarily have to do that. Frankly, I hope you're not printing everything out because if you have your file stored in a cloud-based file management system, then you can access it from wherever you are as long as you have a connection to the internet. Now, I'm not gonna go into all the details on some of the ethical considerations of storing files in the cloud, although suffice it to say that just about every state today has an ethics opinion that says that it is absolutely fine to do as long as you are taking precautions, which is the same precautions you should be taking if you carry documents on a, on a phone or on a laptop, making sure you have a passcode, making sure that you have a password on there as well. But what's great about this, you can upload and download files when you're out of the office. I like the fact that today, instead of sending a 25 megabyte file as an email attachment, I can just send somebody a link to the file that it's stored in Dropbox, for example, and they can download it on their own so it doesn't hurt my email server. And then I can make files available offline in the sense that I can go on my Dropbox app on my iPad, which is a screenshot right here. And if you look really closely over on the left side, a couple of those files, just one of the files right, about right in the middle has a little green icon on there. And that has indicated to me that I've made a local copy of that file down onto the iPad, which means that I can bring that file up even if I don't have a connection to the internet. In many cases, I find this is a replacement for printing documents and stuffing them in a briefcase. In other words, I call my iPad today my digital manila folder because I can carry hundreds of thousands of documents on this device with even the smallest iPad that you can buy today. Now, in a similar vein, which piggybacks right on top of the cloud-based file management, are the second category of apps, which are file managers that you can install on the iPad that will access your files stored up in the cloud. As I mentioned, the digital manila folder, I probably recommend today PDF Expert more than anything else. That's the middle one there. Goodreader has been great. It's been around for a long time. Iannotate is also great, but PDF Expert, if you're looking for one today for $10, well worth that cost because it allows you to view almost any kind of file you can move and copy and rename files just like you do on your Windows computer every day. You can view multiple files at one time. So I like having several tabs open inside PDF Expert so I can view them and tap around to them. And then of course I can annotate PDF files. Um, quickly going to that second check mark there. I was one time training a, a group of litigators in New York City and this is what they use as basically their trial notebook. They put everything into PDF Expert, whether it's PDF files or pictures, audio files or documents or even videos, and they basically can com combine it all into PDF Expert so they can bring it up when they need to at hearing and show it. And then that last little check mark, annotate PDF files. I love this. When I was in law school, I would have to print out documents and I would have a small like pencil case, right, with different colored highlighters because each color represented some kind of an issue to me in my mind and different pens. But now I can bring up a PDF inside PDF Expert and I have all of those capabilities right there. Now I don't have a screenshot to show you the annotation capabilities, but here is a screenshot of PDF Expert that shows you, you can list files from different aspects. And if you look in the, about the middle over on the, on the left side over here, you can see I've got different connections to different cloud services. The Dropbox is there, Box is there, my OneDrive account, my Google Drive, so in other words, I could jump into PDF Expert, I could connect into one of these cloud-based storage services, and then I can have access to all the files. I can download the ones that I need to and basically create a small folder on my iPad, a local folder, so that I can jump on a plane, for example, and not pay the you know, high rate for Wi-Fi there, but I can open up these PDF files and I can highlight and mark up and write in the margin all on my iPad so that when I'm done, I can then, and I land, I can connect back to the internet and I can send them maybe off to my client or whatever else I need to do there. If you wanna know a little bit more about iAnnotate, I have a video review on Apps and Law for that one. All right, number three, moving on. I know we gotta go a little quick here. Microsoft Word. Now, as soon as I say Microsoft Word, most people immediately go to, oh yeah, well I need to edit Word documents on my iPad. And I say, yes, you do, and that is really great to do on the iPad. It's sort of like a stripped-down version. However, 
You can see my comment down at the bottom. I tell people, even if you're not planning on editing Word documents on the iPad or your iPhone or your Android device, you can see these all have Android options here. I still tell people, get the free Microsoft Word app for your device because it allows you to view the document in the way that it's meant to be viewed. Now, all of you get Word documents as email attachments, right? And if you're on an iPad or an iPhone, you can actually tap the attachment and it will open the Microsoft Word document inside your mail app because the iPhone and the iPad come with a document viewer that views, allows you to view most file types. But sometimes the formatting is a little wonky, like it doesn't look exactly the way it's supposed to look if you had brought up that Word document on your computer inside Microsoft Word. So in those cases, if you have the free Microsoft Word app on your device, you can go into your mail, tap on that attachment and say, open in the Microsoft Word app. Not because you're gonna edit it, but because you want it to be, you wanna view it the way it's meant to be viewed with all the correct formatting. It's what we call the fidelity of the document. We want the fidelity of the document to look the way that it's supposed to look. I hope that that makes a little bit of sense. I've got a quick screenshot here of what Microsoft Word looks like on the iPad. It is a free app and they give it away for free. Now, what they want you to do, of course, is to pay for a subscription to Microsoft Office 365. And if you do have a subscription already, then you can jump right in and do all kinds of editing. You can do track changes, you can do advanced edits on Microsoft Word documents, and it works wonderfully. Even with, if you store your files in Dropbox or you store them in, in OneDrive, you can open it from OneDrive, you can edit the document, and it saves it right back up into your cloud service so that you can access it later on your computer. All right, number four, presentation apps. I actually have two different kinds of presentation apps here. The first is what I call the linear presentation. Most of what we're familiar with, Microsoft PowerPoint, right? Or Apple's version is Keynote, which I actually believe is a little superior to Microsoft PowerPoint, but most of us use PowerPoint. I'm a Mac user, so I also use Keynote on the Mac which translates beautifully onto the iPad. But it really doesn't matter because in some cases people will send me PowerPoint files and I need to show that on my iPad. Well, there's Microsoft PowerPoint on the iPad as well. And I can just bring it right up on my iPad and pull it up and give a presentation that way. I think I've got a screenshot here in just a moment. What I tell people most of the time for workflows is create the presentation on your computer just like you've always done, but then before you walk out of the office, make a copy of it over to your iPad. I usually use the iPad for this because it's got a little bit of a bigger screen so that I can see it a little bit better. And then when I get to my presentation, the CLE, whatever I need to do, I will simply just pull up PowerPoint on my iPad, connect it to a projector. There's a little bit more that goes into that. But then I can just drive the PowerPoint presentation right from my iPad and I can walk around the room with my iPad and remotely control the presentation, which is great. And then of course I have access to all the capabilities to mark up slides or I can at, read my speaker notes or I can uh, go back and forth to different slides. It's really nifty what they have done. Now the PowerPoint app is free for the iPad and for Android devices, but you can't really do a lot of editing unless you have a subscription to Office 365. But here's a screenshot right here you can see from my iPad, just like you would See on your computer, you've got, I've got my slides there on the left and then the main slide that I'm working on right in the middle. Now the other kind of presentation I wanna quickly talk about is what I call a dynamic presentation, but I mean that in the sense that it's non-linear. With a PowerPoint or Keynote, you're gonna go slide, 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 and you kinda of know where you're going, right? You've kind of planned that out. But in some cases, like if you're, um, uh, talking to a witness, for example, or you're doing a presentation where you might need to jump around to different places and bring up different documents, then you're going to the world of trial presentation. And for the iPad, probably one of the greatest legal specific apps for the iPad is TrialPad. Now, it's priced a little higher than what most people think that apps should be priced at. However, if you were to get a similarly compared application for Windows, which we used to use Sanction and Trial Director to, uh, today still, 
then uh, this is a fraction of the cost of that. And most people I work with today love the fact that trial pad is a lot, a lot easier to use and uh, pretty much seamless and almost like a DIY kind of an aspect on there. But if you're not sold yet, you can try the Trial Director app for the iPad. It's free. It's nowhere near as polished and pretty as Trial Pad, but it'll give you a little bit of a flavor of how you can use your iPad in trial presentation. I love the fact you can do call outs, you can do highlight. I call it the John Madden mode, and I don't show all that here, but here is a screenshot of Trial Pad on my iPad. Now, this is not what would be shown on the screen that I'm connected to in a courtroom, but you can see I've got a document here right in the middle, and then you can see I've done a call out, and then I've highlighted a text there. Now, what people would see on the screen in the courtroom would basically just be a black background with the document and the call out there. And I could quickly get rid of that call out. I could highlight more text. It's very dynamic in the sense that I can interact with the information as much as I need to. All right, number five, legal research. Certainly, if you subscribe to Lexis Advanced, or Westlaw, you see Westlaw Next, I think, then by all means, get the apps for your mobile devices. So that way you can access information on the go. And even Fastcase, uh, and I don't know, Susan, if anybody's asking or not, sometimes uh, you know, different bar associations will, their members have access to Fastcase, for example, as part of their membership on there. So uh, if anybody wants to ask that, they might be able to get that information uh, from you as well. Uh, so here's just a couple of screenshots on Westlaw. I'm not going to go into that detail because I, sometimes I don't know if people have <laughs> uh, Westlaw or Lexus. But two more quick little apps on legal research, Lawstack and Rulebook. i very much big fan of Lawstack, and here's the reason why. In order to use the services like Westlaw or Lexus, I have to be connected to the Internet on my iPad to get access to all those resources, which is fine because they got a lot of resources and I can get access to it. But I use Lawstack for getting access to things that I would have normally maybe carried a little book around with. For example, I do a lot of e-discovery consulting, and I used to carry around the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure with me all the time in a book that was like dog-eared and tattered, but I had to reference this all the time. Well, now I use Lawstack. doesn't require an internet connection. It replaces that book, plus it keeps everything updated for me. So in the sense, that little book I used to carry around was outdated several years, but now with Lawstack, I can download local to my iPad, the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. I can search for whatever I need, and inside Lawstack, they also offer different states. Uh, it, you know, Different states kind of do it differently, whether it's copyrighted or not, but you can go in and check. I don't know if Massachusetts is available in there or not, but go in and check even if nothing else the federal rules civil procedure and evidence and bankruptcy and a lot of those are all available for free and it's worth having uh with law stack i did a quick little video of that at epson law as well if you wanted to go and see a little bit more number six note taking there are several apps available for the ipad and the android for note taking i'm just going to give you one notability i find continues to take the cake in the sense that it looks great it works great they continue to add fantastic features like they just added the feature where you can select your handwriting and convert it into editable text i don't know why that's always been the holy grail of people wanting to do that because we didn't used to we, we never could do that on a yellow legal pad but i understand some people want to convert it now as long as your handwriting is fairly readable then notability will do a pretty good job at doing that Plus, Notability will also record audio at the same time that you're taking notes. So it synchronizes both of those things together, which is really, really nifty. If you're sitting with a, a client and, and recording the conversation, if you get permission to do so, and you are writing your notes, you can go back to the office and tap into like page two of your notes and start the recording from that point. It's really cool how Notability works. Here's a quick screenshot that I did at a, at a conference that I attended. I wanted to have a picture of the agenda. So since my iPad has a camera on the back, I just took a picture of the document, inserted it into my notes, and then I could write notes around it as I would normally have taken notes at a presentation. It's very, very functional, notability. But again, if you wanted something that was a little bit more robust rather than just sort of handwriting or typing your notes, OneNote or Evernote, which I'm sure many of you have already heard about, it, these are great options. OneNote is from Microsoft. Evernote is on its own. But these, these are really for um, 
a, a, a full comprehensive sorting of all your notes, organizing all of your notes. It synchronizes your notes across different platforms. And in fact, um, a few months ago, I had the pleasure of uh, hosting Heidi Alexander from, uh, from Law Office Management uh, there, where she talked about how their entire office there uses Evernote to organize all the information across the office. It's really a fascinating recording. Um, I, would, I would highly recommend it because she even taught, well, she wrote a book on it for the ABA, first of all, but just the fact that you can even scan business cards into it, keep track of all of that, but uh, Susan could probably get into more detail. This is how they share information back and forth across the office. It's like their repository for all their policies and things going on at the office as well. So that's Evernote. All right, moving on, number seven. This maybe only applies to some of you managing transcripts on the iPad. These are all for iPad only. Transcript Pad is the sister app for Trial Pad, but uh, I see more and more of the firms that I work with using Transcript Pad as the best way to manage the transcripts that they have to deal with. But if you have TextMap, that's another option. Or if you get an e-transcript, which is that PTX file for you know maybe the four or five of you that care, if you get the PTX file for the e-transcript, there is an app that's available for free on the iPad that can read that. So transcript only works with text files, TXT files. You have to require, request those from the court reporter. Text map really only works if you have a text map server on the back end. And then as I mentioned, the e-transcript files for Westlaw case notebook. Here is a quick screenshot of transcript pad. Beautiful, the way that it looks. I know the developer well. They have done a very good job of continuing to update this. I love that you can do the questions in bold and the answers in unbold. You can create your little issue codes and everything, and in the end, spit out a report, which is just a beautiful PDF report of the uh, things that you need. And here's a quick screenshot of the free app, which doesn't look as pretty, right? But you get what you pay for. From Westlaw, if you get an e-transcript from a court reporter, you can open that right there in the uh, iPad. And then I also did a video for that little app as well. Number eight, document scanning. That's crazy. But I say, if your mobile device has a camera, and a very good camera on it, by the way, these have really become fantastic cameras, you can take a picture of a flower or a polar bear or your kids, but you can also take a picture of a document. How crazy is that? ScanBot is my favorite. Scanner Pro is also very good. ScanBot is also available for Android. You can basically just take a picture of a document. I usually just place the document on a desk and then I hover over with my phone or my iPad, take a picture of it. And if you get the premium for ScanBot or just buy Scanner Pro, it will actually OCR the text. Not always the best, but it does a very good job. And then I convert it to PDF and then I can upload it to a cloud storage. Here's a quick screenshot of ScanBot. This was um, an agenda from a a um, presentation I did down in, in Texas where I just basically took a picture of the agenda, converted it to PDF, and then I uploaded it to Dropbox, which was great. I use this all the time for when I'm at a meeting with a client and you know they usually tell me, well, sit here, I'm gonna walk down the hall and I'll make a copy of this for you. And I say, I'm, I'm too much of a nerd for that. Just put the document right there on your desk and I just create my own little scanned version of it, which is great because once I create it as a PDF, I then can open it in PDF Expert, which means that I can mark it up and annotate it too, which is wonderful. So again, I did a little video of Scanner Pro if you wanted to see that in action. Number nine, we're almost done. Task list, to-do managers, right? They are the bane of our existence, but here are just a couple of thoughts on this quickly. If you have an iPhone or an iPad, I think Apple has continued to do a great job of integrating the Reminders app with Siri. I love that, because I could just say, hey, and the name, which she shall not be named, because if I say it, my, my devices will turn on. So I can say, hey, the name of which she shall not be named. And I can just say, remind me to do so-and-so in 10 minutes, or remind me to do something another day, or remind me when I get back home to let the dog out, because of course the phone has a GPS radio in it so that it knows when I'm actually home, because I've told it where home is. Uh, it's not the prettiest and most functional app, but the iOS Reminders app is really good and you should take advantage of that since it's already there. I used to use a wonderful 
little app called Wonderlist. Wunderlist is what I used to say because it was, I think it was German. But Microsoft purchased it. It was so good. And they've created Microsoft to do. If you just want a very simple list uh, or an app that you can just do list and have little check boxes there, that's the best one to go with. And it ties in with your Microsoft account. And then Todoist is one that a lot of people love as well. Here's just a quick screenshot of Microsoft To Do. You can see it's very clean. You can tap on a project that you have in the middle. And then you have your list of all the tasks up there on the right side. Last but not least, I'm going to leave you with a security-minded app. Now, here are my two recommendations, but if these are not good enough, or if you have something else, fantastic. The takeaway is get a password manager. I have gone on record saying there will soon be a day when you will be required to use things like password managers and probably even email encryption because it is a basic level of security that we can apply to the information that we're entrusted with. Password managers, if you've never used one before, I would say start with LastPass. LastPass is great, it's browser-based, and it's very simple to understand. Just go to the website and start looking around. If you are a more, little more advanced user, or you really wanna get, you wanna commit to this, to me, I don't think you can get one better than 1Password. Now, 1Password started out as a Mac app, but it is now available on the mobile devices and it also available on the Windows machine. I use it on all my different machines and my laptops and my iPad and my iPhone. What's great about this is that it creates crazy passwords for you so that you're not using the same password at every website. That's how people get quote hacked. And it makes sure that you are using secure passwords for all those websites. But you say, Brett, you hot shot, what if I forget that one password that opens up the one password app? Then you're probably up the creek. But guess what? You're not gonna forget that password. It's gonna be a very good, very strong password and it's the only one that you have to worry about. Having access, if I'm out of the office and I need access into a, a, a system or a service, having one password on my phone and my iPad has been a lifesaver so many times. Plus, I know I'm much more secure. Here's just a quick little screenshot there on my iPhone and iPad of the different ways you can keep your Amazon accounts and everything. In fact, by the way, get a subscription because I start sharing some of this now even with my, uh, my wife because people talk about today that sort of the, uh, you know, the, the, the inevitable is gonna happen. And today we have so much information that is all inside secure websites, for example, bank account number, all this stuff. How do you keep track of all that? If you can use something like 1Password, that's much more secure. Now that's on the personal side, you can also apply it to the business side as well. And if you wanted a little bit more, I did actually have Jeff on one of my earlier podcasts where he was talking all about 1Password. Uh, and it's very, very, very good to get some more information about that. All right, that's it. Thanks for having me on. I know I went over just a little bit, but Susan, I'm happy to answer any questions if, if people are still here. Yeah, oh my gosh, Brett, this was fantastic. Don't worry about going over. Okay, good. <laughs> um, some questions. We gotta get back to work. <laughs> um, so the first question, let me just read it to you. Just, <clears throat> do you have any recommendations for a calendar management app, particularly something that helps both myself and my paralegal receptionist to know where I am or need to be? Oh yeah, okay, excellent question. Now. Um, it goes a little bit deeper. I wish I had a simple answer, but it goes a little bit deeper because in some cases it can depend on what you are using on your back end. For example, if you have a subscription to Microsoft Office 365, which if you don't, you will soon because we all will. That's the way that we'll be getting Microsoft Office soon. But if you have a subscription already with Office 365 and you're probably then using Microsoft Outlook to keep track of your calendar, you have an easy way to share your calendars with your assistants or anybody else, for example. If you have um, a Mac or an iPhone or an iPad, you have a free iCloud account. iCloud will also give you access to a, a free calendar that you can use as part of your account and you can easily share your calendars with, uh, with, with others, whether it's on a personal level with your spouse or whether it's with your uh, internal um, office assistants and colleagues. For similarly, if you have Google Apps, for example, or if you have a free Google Calendar, 
that's yet another easy way that you can set up your own calendar and then you can easily share those calendars or even just different calendars with others. So again, I know that's a longer answer, but it, it depends really on where you're getting your calendar from right now. If you're an iCloud or Google Calendar or Microsoft Office 365, either of those ways will allow you to share your calendar with others. And frankly, then you could just pull it, like if you have an Office 365 calendar, I can go into my iPhone here, pull up the calendar app that comes free with the iPhone, and I can connect to an Exchange account or a Google account or anything else that I need to. And the same way if I have an assistant, for example, or my spouse. So I hope that that helps a little bit. It really depends a little bit more on your specific setup, which I'm happy to go into more detail if you want to connect with me a little bit later. Got another question. Do you have any suggestions for a time tracking app? Yes, I do. So um, again, it could depend a little bit more on what you might be using on the back end. Let me just quickly go because uh, Susan and Heidi, a lot of those could give you a lot more information about practice management applications, things like Clio or Rocket Matter. If you are using some kind of a practice management system on the back end, all of those services have great mobile apps and you could just jump into that app and you could start tracking your time there and it automatically associates it with the actual matter. So if you've got anything set up like that, that's the first place that I would recommend going to try it. If you need something more generic or you don't have anything tied directly with a practice management system, one of the, uh, th there are several out there that are specifically focused for uh, legal uh, practices. Bill for Time, B-I-L, the numeral four, T-I-M-E, billfortime.com is one that's great that you can set up if you want to. I use a, a, a service, I'm still using it for free, it's called Toggle. It's T-O-G-G-L dot com without the E, T-O-G-G-L, toggle dot com. It's a very simple way that I can just track some time on that aspect. And if, you've re if you're at a fairly larger firm or company um, and, and you have a system set up to kind of collect all that information, by far some of the best uh, uh, services you can use is an app called iTimekeep. Letter I, like iPad, but it's iTimekeep. It's from a company called Bellfield iTimekeep would be something that I would also recommend. You have to pay for that because it basically is, is built to interact with whatever backends that you may have for you know, your financial systems or anything, but that would be another option that I would, that I would recommend. That was a lot, <laughs> but hopefully, hopefully it makes sense. Yeah, those are great recommendations. Um, I just wanna add something to that before we get to the next question. Um, if you end up going with something or thinking you're gonna go with something that isn't free, um, you might want to do a price comparison with the project um, or practice management software because uh, I've, I've seen, you know, that um, it can come pretty darn close to the cost of practice management software. And even like if you're here in Massachusetts and you're thinking about practice management software, the social law library has an amazing deal because it's a member benefit. So if you join great. social law, you get it for free. You oh, get a full of suite. For free, that's a no-brainer. I, I mean, because I know. The, the the thing is, Susan, like where you're going, if you track time in that, it's already tied to a matter, which already has the contacts associated with it and a calendar aspect. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, it's, and it's a great, great price. Um, okay, so next question: Do you have any recommendations on project management apps or software that are good for groups? Ooh. Project management, and so I'm, I'm guessing we want to go a little bit beyond just like a task um, tracking app. Um, and, and, well, let me start there quickly. If you want something really simple, something like Microsoft To Do that I showed earlier, let me see if I can just jump back up to it here. Microsoft To Do or even Todoist, if you set that up, you can share your account with others or even, or just even you can, you, in Microsoft To Do, you set up different lists on there. So you can share one list, right, with somebody in your office. And I have to tell you, I find that to be extremely uh, helpful. Let me see if they have anything on the screenshot. I don't think they do. But in some cases, <laughs> my wife will share a task list with me, right? It's the, uh, the honey to do list. But um, we don't write anything down because I can just pull up the Microsoft To Do app and then I can find where the task that she has shared with me. And we just can, we can keep track of it that way. Uh, another system I'll throw out there is one called Trello, T-R-E-L-L-O. 
It's got a really nice visual component to it where you're dragging things around. They call it the Kanban approach to it, but I find some people use that as, as a, a project management. But then, of course, if you, if you want to go even higher than that, there are, you know, Microsoft uh, Project has been around for years and years and is, is the granddaddy of project management software. Now, that's when you're starting to get into things like what is it, the PERT charts and the Gantt charts and all kinds of stuff like that that you're really tracking some crazy stuff on there. But I find most people are happy with sort of a task list that they can just track that. Some people even create sort of a template to say, if we got a new matter, here are the things that I want to be done, right? And they assign that to somebody that way. So I find for the most part, this is, this is more than enough for a lot of people. But if you want to go more than that, there's another company that has a lot of options out there called Zoho, Z-O-H-O, and they have a project management component on there as well. That's all online, but if you really want to dig deep into what we really call project management, like the technical project management, that would be something to look at. Thank you so much. Um, Brett, I can't thank you enough for sharing your time and advice. It's been incredible. I learned a lot. Um, Good. <laughs> We're gonna be providing a recording and Brett slides on our website, uh, www.masslomap.org, as soon as we can get to it, which should be, I don't know, I don't know, I can't speak for Rachel, but she's really amazing. So I imagine, you know, within a week. I wanna thank you for tuning in today. And I wanna remind you that next month, on February 13th, we will have Dan Lear, and he is going to talk about the what, why, and how of the lawyer entrepreneur. Oh, yeah. Dan's great. That's <laughs> wonderful. I might tune in for that one. <laughs> to see you. Um, so thank you, everybody, for tuning in, and have a terrific afternoon. Um, Brett, how about if I just follow up with you by phone? Wonderful. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you.